Good morning, church. Welcome to the Cathedral of the Rockies, Boise First United Methodist Church. We're glad you're with us today for worship. It's a great day to worship, and you matter to God. Would you join me as we hear these words from the serenity prayer? Let's pray together. God, grant me the serenity to accept the things I cannot change, the courage to change the things I can, and the wisdom to know the difference. Amen. Let's continue our worship together. Friends, let's pray together. Would you join me as we pray together the Lord's Prayer? Let us pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Amen. 
Welcome to worship. My name is Rob Walters. I'm one of our pastors. I spend most of my time here at the Amity campus, and it's a great joy to be with you in worship today. I want to begin by asking you a question, and that is, how are you doing during this pandemic? Really, how are you doing? How are you doing with the isolation, with the stress, with the pressure? and with the doubt. Sometimes we all struggle with these things, preachers included. If you're a little bit like me, you get nervous just being around people that cough. I hear a cough off in the distance and I suddenly get nervous a little bit like this. I have that same reaction too. I turn and I look and I get nervous and I want to move away. And then how do we fill our time? We spend time in Zoom meetings. We spend more time with family. We spend time with other relatives, but it still feels very isolating, no matter how much we try to connect digitally with others. So we do things like fishing for cars. Take a look. I love that because humor is good for our souls. It helps us in moments of doubt to laugh. You know, we all have doubts. 
Preachers have doubts, doctors and nurses and firefighters, those that serve in our hospitals, theologians, car salesmen, bus drivers, we all struggle with doubt, especially in these kinds of times. We have doubts about our jobs, we have doubts about financial security, and sometimes we even have doubts about where God is in the midst of a pandemic. In these moments, it's important for us to remember doubt and fear, they are very natural. And that God is big enough for our doubt and for our questions. Our scripture story today talks a lot about doubt and fear. And I believe there's a challenge there for you and for me. The story comes from Mark chapter 4, verses 35 to 41. Will you read along with me even right there at home? That day when evening came, he said to his disciples, let us go over to the other side. Leaving the crowd behind, they took him along just as he was in the boat. There were also other boats with them. So where exactly were they? I'm going to show you a map. They are on the Sea of Galilee and on the very northern edge in a city called Capernaum. You'll see it in the red box. And they are getting ready to head across the water. Now Capernaum is a real place and it's by the sea. It's a beautiful drive just to drive down the road near the shoreline and see what that part of the world looks like. But when you actually arrive at Capernaum, it looks like ruins. It's a place of excavation today, and it's a place that is divided between the Franciscans and the Greek Orthodox. Scripture goes on. Let's read this together. A furious squall came up, and the waves broke over the boat, so that it was nearly swamped. Jesus was in the stern, sleeping on a cushion. You get the picture here, right? A big, boat-sinking kind of massive storm, and Jesus asleep on the cushion. Doesn't seem quite right, does it? Now I have to tell you that when I was growing up, my granddad had a boat. We loved spending time at Grandpa's place on Table Rock Lake in the Ozarks of Missouri. It was a great place to go. I brought you an old photo to take a look at. Yes, that's me. I'm the cute one right in the middle. You, you can probably tell because I'm just as cute still today. But we had so many adventures on that boat. We had so much fun, but we had a few moments of doubt and fear too. One time we launched the boat just after a service appointment and we had not checked the drain plug to see if it was screwed back in. We got it out on the water and sure enough, it began to fill with water. The water cut the engine. And we had to jump in the water and try to swim the boat back to the shore as quickly as we could and drag it up on the trailer. I remember my mom saying, we'll make it, we'll make it. And I'm thinking the whole time, no, we won't. <laughs> no, we won't. Then another time, we experienced a squall bad enough that it sunk grandpa's boat all the way to the bottom of the lake while it was still tied to the dock. I promise you, in these moments of fear and doubt, there was no sleeping in the boat. The tension was high and, and there was, it wasn't even a squall like the Sea of Galilee and we were still scared and filled with doubt. So Jesus, come on, what's going on here? There's a huge squall and they are scared and you are sleeping in the boat. Scripture goes on. Would you read with me? The disciples woke him and said to him, Teacher, don't you care if we drown? I imagine they didn't ask this quietly. They were fearful. They were downright scared. After all, Scripture doesn't say specifically who was in the boat, but they were likely fishermen because fishermen were four of the 12 disciples. They knew what storms looked like. They had seen the squalls, and even professional fishermen were scared 
at what this storm could do. This wasn't a normal storm on the lake. Let's keep reading scripture together. He got up, rebuked the wind, and said to the waves, quiet, be still. Then the wind died down, and it was completely calm. Okay, a full-blown miracle right in front of all the disciples. Jesus calms the storm, and remember, it wasn't just one boat. Scripture said other boats went with them too. Can you imagine the party at sea? They are clapping, they are hooting and hollering, they are cheering for Jesus, conquering the storm. But Jesus, he doesn't celebrate the miracle at all. Scripture goes on, you know the drill, let's read this together. He said to his disciples, why are you so afraid? Do you still have no faith? That reminds me of my mom. We will make it, we'll make it. I'm thinking the disciples are answering, no, we won't. No, we won't. You see, this is just one of the questions, one of the 307 questions that Jesus asks, and he never provides an answer. I imagine that what the disciples were thinking, well, Jesus, we are professional fishermen. We see the squall. We know what happens in these moments. And you are napping in my greatest moment of fear. Wonder why I'm afraid. <laughs> Scripture ends like this. They were terrified and asked each other, who is this? Even the wind and the waves obey him. You know, this time of coronavirus, it feels to me like a bit of a storm. It's a moment when we see images like this, images of empty streets that cause us doubt, empty shelves in the stores that cause us deep fear and anxiety and tension, empty classrooms in schools and empty rooms at businesses. These cause us deep fear and doubt. If you're normal, you feel anxiety, you feel stress, you feel fear, concern about the future, and deep tension. As a church, we feel tension over questions like, how do you know when it's time to return safely? So we're working hard to develop plans that will help us all stay safe when we can finally be back together. But worry and fear and anxiety, they can seem fully present a lot of the time. And people will say things like, we are all in the same boat together. It's well-meaning. It's trying to remind us that we have a responsibility to keep each other safe. I, I love the sentiment. We see it when people wear masks that are around us or the way they'll come close and then step back further and remind themselves to keep a social distance. The way people will step aside in the grocery aisle so we don't pass too close to each other. It's a good thought. We're all in the same boat. The problem, though, is that it is not accurate. We are not in the same boat at all. More accurately, we are all in the same storm, not the same boat. Some have a yacht that they can navigate through the storm on. Some have a small fishing boat, others have a dinghy. Some are in a life raft that's developing holes in it. A few are in the water with a life jacket surrounding their neck. Others are in the water treading, trying to stay above the squall. And some, they succumb to the waves. The role of Christians the role of the church, the role for you and I is to model what Jesus did in the face of fear and doubt. He worked to calm the storm for others. And he kept everyone in the boat. This is why Jesus told stories of going after a missing sheep or, or spending time with lepers. Now, there was another pandemic spent time with sinners and tax collectors and so many more. Jesus was hearing about the fear while trying to get everyone in the same boat, even when society 
dictated otherwise. As I prepared for today, I noticed a key difference between the way Mark and Matthew both tell this scripture story. Mark records it like this. Jesus said, uh, or they said to Jesus, teacher, don't you care if we drowned? Now you notice they call him teacher, a way of not yet defining that they know his identity is Christ. But Matthew records it completely differently. He says the phrase from the disciples was, Lord, save us. We're going to drown. In this version, they knew Jesus was Lord. Is Jesus teacher or Lord for you and I? And does that affect our doubt? Doubt and fear are natural. God is big enough for our doubt and our questions. There's a second difference between the way Matthew and Mark record the story. Mark says it this way, he got up, rebuked the wind and said to the waves, quiet, be still. Then the wind died down and it was completely calm. He said to his disciples, why are you so afraid? Do you still have no faith? You see, Mark says that Jesus first calms the waves and second asks the disciples why they are afraid. They had just seen a miracle. Why be afraid at all? It's easy to believe once you have seen the miracle. Once you have seen the vaccine, the treatment, the healing, the cure, then it's easy to let the fear go. Matthew's gospel says this differently. It goes like this. He replied, you of little faith, why are you so afraid? Then he got up and rebuked the wind and the waves and it was completely calm. You see, Matthew tells us Jesus questions their doubt prior to calming the storm. While the squall is still taking place, the storm is happening, Jesus, duh. We are scared because doubt and fear are natural, especially if we haven't seen the miracle yet. God is big enough for our doubt and our questions. I'll say it again. The role of Christians, the role of the church, the role for you and I is to model what Jesus did in the face of fear and doubt. He worked to calm the storm and he worked to keep everyone in the boat. What if during this pandemic, we could be a tangible reminder of God's love for others more clearly in the midst of fear and doubt? What if we work to convert doubt and fear into love and trust of our neighbor? What if instead of using our stock puppets to count the cars, we looked more closely at what our neighbor needed from us? What about instead of turning our head like a chihuahua as soon as we hear someone cough and look disparagingly at them, that we take the appropriate precautions, we help them isolate and then offer to do their grocery shopping for them. Doubt and fear are natural, and God is big enough for our doubt and our questions. We have to help everyone have a boat. This week I learned about two exciting ways that people have helped others conquer fear and doubt. These are people that made sure that others, sometimes complete strangers, knew that God was big enough for doubt and questions. I want to tell you about Becky Krinsky Cox. She is an opera singer at the Luzerner Theater in Lucerne, Switzerland. The theater where she sings, like everywhere else, is closed because of COVID-19. But she and others, they wanted to make a difference. So they did an impromptu concert for residents trapped in quarantine in their homes due to COVID-19. Take a look.
Isn't that awesome? What a way to make a difference. Now I have to tell you, I have a special connection to Becky. You see, in a previous career, I was her junior high school music teacher lots and lots of years ago. So when I saw her video, I reached out to her and I asked her why she chose to do this. Here's what she said. Since our community can't come to the opera, we are bringing opera to our community. While strictly adhering to social distancing regulations, we are popping up all over the city to sing for our neighbors. We find an apartment complex with a central courtyard area and notify residents ahead of time to come to their balconies for a short concert. They laugh and sing with us and with their fellow neighbors, but from the safety of their own homes. Music is my lifelong passion and always brings me joy. I feel very grateful to share it with others during this time. You see, we are called to use our gifts to inspire faith and conquer doubt. When I saw that video, I saw people doing just that, using their God-given gift to inspire faith and to conquer doubt in others. So Becky, I know you and all of those in the opera there in Switzerland are worshiping with us online today. We want to say thank you for making a difference. Thank you for modeling what it looks like to be at our best when others are deeply struggling. But I want to ask a question for all the rest of us, for you and I both. What can you do to share with others that inspires faith and helps conquer doubt? You don't have to sing opera like Becky, but if you can, go for it. If you can't sing opera, what can you do? Our call is to use our gifts to inspire faith and conquer doubt, but that doesn't stop in Switzerland. I recently talked to Mary Conkey, who attends our downtown campus. Mary and her husband, Bob, they are always on the lookout for ways to make a difference and transform the lives of others. Mary retired after a head injury about 10 years ago and had a hard conversation with God where she, where she said, God, how am I supposed to serve you now? And she heard God's clear reply, Mary, right there in your neighborhood. So they've done several things. They've added the names of families with lots of children, those out of work. They've added them to the grocery gift card receipt list. Those of you that gave money towards these gift cards, thank you for what you're doing. You're helping feed people in our community. Mary and Bob had also opened up a front porch library for the community and oftentimes read books to kids on the lawn. But when she saw the pandemic begin, she converted her front porch library to a place where people could pick up staples. Things like peanut butter and toilet paper and other necessities, even some books, all at no cost. She cleans them carefully and then places them out there for others. You can see that in this photograph. But I asked why she did it. And here's what she said. She said, it's especially important that kids feel safe but I also want kids to know that I love Jesus. She said, the more you serve, the more you get back. Mary also paints and distributes rocks as a tangible reminder of Jesus' love. You see, they do this because Mary and Bob know that we are called to use our gifts to inspire faith and conquer doubt in others. I know you're both worshiping online today, Mary and Bob, and we just want to say thank you for making a difference in the community around us. Thank you for loving Boise, and thank you for transforming the world. But I want to ask you and I a question again. Where can we share with others? What could we share that inspires faith and helps conquer doubt? You and I can do that too. I wanna give you some action steps today. These are the ways that we love God, that we love self, and that we love others. Number one, remember that doubt and fear are natural. Accept and, and embrace those moments as a reminder that we need Christ. Number two, when you pray, be honest with God. Know that God is big enough for our doubt and our questions. Give God the fear and the tension and the anxiety back. And number three, 
help everyone have a boat. Identify this week one way that you could use the gifts that God has given you to inspire faith and conquer doubt for others. Then go carry it out. Friends, my hope for you today is this. May you build a boat for someone else by living into those moments of doubt and fear, using your gifts to inspire others. Let's pray. Holy and gracious God, we come to you in moments of fear, in moments of anxiety, in moments of tension. God, we work to give those back to you. We know that you are big enough for our doubt and our questions. And God, even though it's natural for us to feel that way, God, we long for a place of peace. God, help us to use the gifts that you have given us to help conquer doubt and fear in others so that we might help calm the storm and to help everyone into a boat. God, help us work to transform the world around us by conquering doubt and fear. It is in the name of our Lord, Jesus Christ, that we pray and all of God's people said, Amen. Friends, generosity has always been a part of our faith and part of Christianity. If Cathedral of the Rockies is your home, we invite you at this time to prepare your offering, to go ahead and give online or to prepare that check to mail in. If you're temporarily with us during COVID-19, we, we're glad you're part of us, but would you remember to give to your church? We wanna thank you for your generosity. We'll put some stats below me and show you the giving for the grocery cards this week, nearly, maybe even over $20,000 by this point, but check that stat and see where we are. Thanks for seeing the people in need and making a different world. I surrender all to him I freely give. I will ever love and trust him in his presence daily. It has been great to worship together. But we not only want to worship with you, we want to be in service with you. We want to be in ministry with you. So please go to the website and see the opportunities to serve, to give, to study, to join us as we continue to make together a different world. Friends, it's been a great joy to worship God with you today. I want to remind you the same four things that our senior pastor has reminded us the past few weeks. First, you are loved by and matter to God. Second, no crisis lasts forever. There is always hope and someone will help. Just ask. Would you receive this benediction? As you go forward into the world, go forward seeking to serve Christ Seek to conquer fear and anxiety in others by offering a boat to everyone you might meet. And when you do, you'll receive the blessings of God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit 
And all of God's people said, Amen.